Fed up with the everyday grind. Tired out from the summer heat. Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are clinging precariously to a diving, pitching longboat, lashed by mountainous seas in the middle of a hurricane. And at the helm, driving you on, is a man bent on revenge and willing to kill for it. Tonight, we escape to the open sea with an ancient tramp steamer and its fighting captain, as F.R. Buckley told it in his ironic story, Habit. (laughs) Very well. The court has no more questions. Step down, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, Your Honor. Well, Captain Weatherfield, you've just heard the complaining witness. Have you anything to say in your own defense? Yeah. Uh, hit the man about a bit. No doubt of that, Your Honor. In fact, with half chance, I'd have pounded his blasted head off. <laughs> Quiet. Quiet. We'll have order in the court. Then you admit the charges, Captain Weatherfield. That I hit him? Eh, yeah. But I had extenuating circumstances, Yana. I see. And what were they? He laughed at my ship. At the Wakelin, Your Honor. As fine a freighter as ever steamed out of here on the Liverpool run. I don't quite he see. He stood there on the wharf. Squint eyed son of a landlubbered lawyer. He said my ship looked like an old woman. With her dress on backwards, her hair not combed. That's when I flattened him out. Yes, and I still say that's what she looks like. Order! Why, you confounded little pipsqueak, I'll break you apart. Sit down, Captain Weatherby. I will not. Grab him, Bailey. Let go of me, confounded, let go of me. Let go of me, I say. Order in the court. Captain Weatherfield. Captain. Weatherfield, this court finds you guilty of assault and battery as charged and sentences you to seven days in the new Bristol City Jail. All right, Bailey, lock him up. And that's the way it started, with the captain getting seven days in the new Bristol Jail. Yeah, but it went a whole lot further before it was over. It was like a bolt of chain lightning that may take a dozen strange turns or more before it finally strikes home. And uh, actually, of course, (laughs) the Wakelin was a funny-looking old scow. She'd had 30 years on the North Atlantic with never a part being replaced so long as there was some way of patching it up. Yeah, she was a regular joke of a ship. That is, to everybody except Captain Weatherfield... Yeah, those of us who were officers aboard her had learned a long time before not to hint anything like that to him. No, she was the Queen Mary and the Normandy and his firstborn child all rolled up into one. So you can bet your life we all kept sober faces when the captain finally came aboard at the end of the week. Mr. Connolly? Yes, sir. Well, everything in order? Will we be able to sail in an hour? Yes, sir. I've been keeping her ready for the last four days, just in case... That will do. Might, uh, I'm uh, fully aware that we're four days past schedule. And the reason for it will not be discussed on board. Is that clear? Yes, Captain. I've been badly treated in this town, Mr. Connolly. Thrown behind bars like some thieving dock rat. I don't feel good about it. And if it takes me the rest of my life, I'm going to even up the score. Do you understand that? I, uh, I think so. You think so, sir? I, yes, sir. All right. Then button up your collar and go get up ahead of steam. And so three days later, we were plowing through a heavy sea 580 miles out on the Atlantic. The spray was freezing in the rigging. 
we were flirting with the fringe of a northeast hurricane. Blast this double blasted confounded wind. Mr. Connolly. In here, Captain. Uh, well, how's she looking, Mr. Connolly? Oh, not so bad. We're taking the seas in our quarter, and so far we're making only about four inches of water an hour. Four inches of water an hour, sir? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, then we'll take a chance on it. We'll take a chance on what, uh, sir? A distress message. Just picked it up in the wireless shack. Oh. Here, take a look. Mm hmm. The freighter Johannes out of New Bristol. Main shaft broken, auxiliaries out of commission, ship in water fast. Latitude 4630, longitude. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, yeah, about 90 miles from us, snob in the west. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Connolly. Lay out the course. The what? We should sight her sometime around dawn. If we hold to full speed all night. Full speed? Dead into a hurricane? Why, the wakeland and fall apart in two hours. I uh, doubt it. She's a good ship. Lay out the course. Yeah, but the Johannes is right in the main shipping lane. Somebody else is bound to pick her up before morning anyway. Mr. Connolly, we can hope not. What do you mean, uh, hope not? Evidently, you didn't notice her registry, Mr. Connolly. She's out of New Bristol. Well, what of it? That, as you may recall, is the town that threw me into jail. Gotten all the papers. Like as not, my daughters up in Maine have probably read about it by now. I'll not have them thinking their father's a man who does nothing but go around punching people in the noggin. All right, but what's it got to do with this? I'm going to be alongside the Johannes before anybody else is, Mr. Connolly. I'm going to rescue every man aboard her. Then I'm going to take them back to New Bristol and get a public apology out of that town. And I'll see that that gets in the papers, too. I've never heard of anything so crazy in all my life. I don't care what you've never heard of, Mr. Connolly. Lay out that course now before I get mad. Decide to punch somebody's blasted head off. Well, the little cock of the walk made good the first part of his plan, all right. In spite of a broken steam injector that had to be patched up with rigging wire, by shortly after dawn, he had us hove to half a cable length off from the Johannes. She was down by the stern and listing badly, but still afloat. The wind was howling like a banshee, and the flying spume was freezing all over our decks. There was no doubt but what the next part of our job was going to be a lot tougher than the first part. Mr. Connolly, you got a boat crew together? Yes, sir. There'll be five seamen and a third mate. I'll take charge myself. Leave the third mate aboard. I'll take charge myself. My show, I'm going to run it. All right, Captain, whatever you say. Well, what's holding this up? Let's get this boat over the side. Lots of frozen, Captain. Carpenter's is trying to break his nose. Well, he's not cracking walnuts at a tea party. Here, Chips, give me that mallet. Uh, Mr. Roberts! Yes, sir? You'll stay on board? Yes, sir. Keep an oil slick running. Waves out there. Pretty high. Pretty high? I've never seen him any higher. Well, I can't help it, Mr. Connolly. I've got to... Uh, there, they did it. Both two ready. Ready aboard, sir. All right, then. Lower away. For the seven of us who went overside in the longboat, that command was the beginning of a nightmare. If things had been bad up on the Wakeland's deck, they were a hundred times worse down there in the very midst of that smashing, that tumbling maelstrom of water and wind. A continuous driving spray was torn from the wave crests and froze solid on the gunnels and the boat seats and on our faces. One man bailed constantly while the others pulled away on the oars with bleeding hands. And even then, we were never far from foundering. Captain Weatherfield sat in the stern and shouted orders none of us could hear, but we could see his face, and that was enough to keep us at it. With a halo of sheet glass round his sou'wester and his gray beard turned to a frozen mass of jumbled icicles, he looked like Neptune come to life. Or maybe even more like, like the devil himself. Yeah, 
It took us over two hours before we finally hauled in against the rusty side of the battered old Johannes. Ahoy, the deck! Hey, sir! In what can you talk to a matter? You'll have to jump for it. Can't use a ladder. Sea's too heavy. Understand? Already here. Wait till we come up on a swell. We'll hold as steady as we can. Stand by now. No, not yet. Good, good Lord, he fell on the gun. Blasted fool told him to wait. He smashed in his chest. Why, it's the captain of the ship. Then he had no business jumping fast anyhow. Haul him aboard, Mr. Connolly. Get him out of the way. All right. Ready on deck? Aye, aye, sir. All right, then. Steady. Now. Good. Stow that man aft there. On deck. Wait for the swell. Wait, wait. Now. Get him, Colonel Lee. A blast to see. You on deck. Jump now. Wait. You better help him off there. Here comes another. Catch him, catch him. Pull him in, Colonel Lee. Good. Back horse, you. Stand by. Pull an aft right there. Here comes another one. Hold her steady. Keep one oar against the side there. Anybody else up there, mister? No. No, sir. Six of us. Others lost overboard last night. All right, then. Back off the oars. You there, Plano. Get a hold of that oar. He, he can't do it very well with with only one arm, Captain. What do you mean, one arm? He broke his arm a couple of minutes ago when we bumped aside. Then give him a bucket. At least he can bail. All right, let's go. It was six hours before we finally got back aboard the Wakelin. But we did get back, and I doubt if any other man but Captain Weatherfield could have done it. True enough, he fainted across the engine room hatch once we were on board, but uh, I don't forget. He was 72 years old. He'd taken a crew of six out in an open boat on the high seas in the middle of a hurricane, rescued six more men off a sinking ship, and brought the whole 12 back alive. Well, one of them, of course, was only barely alive, and that was Captain Miller of the Johannes. He was still unconscious. I had him put in a bunk and hoped for the best. And then I turned in to grab a few hours' sleep. I guess it was sometime after midnight when the third mate called me. I got dressed, went down, woke up the captain. Confound it, Mr. Connolly. <clears throat> Can't a man even close his eyes aboard this ship without somebody rousing him out of his bunk? I'm sorry, Captain. Thought you ought to know. Uh, uh, Miller's conscious now and wants to see you. He thinks he's, he's dying. Dying, is it? Yeah. I'll see about that. Where's my pants? Uh, uh, here you are, sir. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Might be a good thing if Miller did die, uh, according to his first mate, Larson. Huh? Well, Wait. Larson says they uh, they had plenty of warning of this storm, but Miller drove straight on into it. He was racing for port. Oh, racing for port. Yeah. Bad business. There'll be an inquiry on it. He'll lose his ticket when they find out. It's also bad business, Mr. Connolly, when first mates talk out of turn. Hm. Come on. Where is he? I put him in the cabin off the wardroom. The third mate's in there with him now. Mm -hmm. How is the ship heading? Due south. Due south? Well, we're running before the wind. Can't do anything else. I told you, Mr. Connolly, to lay a course for New Bristol. I know, but we can't do it. The main boiler's out, and we're on the auxiliaries. It may take two days to fix it. Ah, confound the luck. Risk my life to rescue a man. Tries to die on me. Now that bonehead engineer's let the main boiler break down. That's uh, not his fault. It should have been replaced five years ago. Five years ago what, Mr. Connolly? Five years ago, sir. Good. Uh, here we are. Oh, glad you got here, sir. I was getting worried. Yeah, it's all right, Mr. Roberts. Here, stand back a bit and hold the light up. Yes. There, that's fine. Evening, Captain Miller. Evening, Captain... You're in some pain, I take it? Yeah. Feels like something sharp. Stick in my chest. Getting worse. Hmm. Something sharp, eh? No doubt the broken end of a rib poking into your lungs. Yeah. Yeah. 
Guess so. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Feels like there's a rib gone here. Uh, oh. Uh, well, I want to make a s statement for the log. Oh, I do. I figure you're getting ready to die, is that it? Uh, yeah. Not much chance. Shouldn't I? Shouldn't I jump first? No, you shouldn't have. Understand you was racing for pot. Drove straight into the storm. Yeah. I had to. It's my wife. Her first baby. I wanted to be with her. What's he saying, sir? His wife's thinking of having a baby, Roberts. Oh. Statement. Responsibility. We'll discuss that later, Captain. Mm. That lung gets a hole punched in it. You're done for. Well, he's practically yeah. done for now. You know, Mr. Connolly, I saw a doctor open up a man once and take a broken rib out of him. I think I can remember fairly well how he went about it. And there ought to be some chloroform on board. Well, ca well, Captain, Captain Weathers... You shut up, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Captain Miller, it's one chance in a million, but you've got no chance now. How about it? Uh, anything. Doesn't matter. Be an inquiry, boy. Better to die. Well, we'll worry about that later. All right, then. Go find that chloroform, Mr. Roberts. Yes, sir. And bring me a bar of soap. Yes, sir. And get a couple of them little knives, uh, whatever they call them, out of the medicine locker. Yes, sir, right away. Uh, Mr. Connolly, go wake up that first mate of his. Get him in here. We'll need a witness to Captain Miller's consent. All right, sir. And Mr. Connolly. Yes, sir. Find chips and borrow his chest of tools. Never can tell what you'll find when you start to open a man up. Ten minutes, we had everything ready. Larson signed a statement, swearing that Captain Miller had agreed to it. And the third mate, with his face white as a sheet, stood at the head of the bunk, dripping chloroform under a towel and holding it over Miller's nose and mouth. I held the light in one hand and kept the other on the patient's pulse while Captain Weatherfield rolled up his sleeves and started in on a major operation that he'd thought he'd seen some doctor perform once. Everything snug and proper. How's he seem to be getting along, Mr. Connolly? Uh, I don't know. He's still breathing. I know he's breathing, man. It's his chest I'm operating on. How's his pulse? I'm pretty weak. Uh, no worse than it was. Hmm. Keep that chloroform dripping, Mr. Roberts. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, uh, there's no time like the present. Oh. Uh, Hold that light steady, Mr. Conley. Yes, sir. Steady yourself. Huh. Now, let me see. I think that doctor did it like, like this. Hmm? I've used up half the chloroform, Captain. Keep it dripping, Roberts. Hmm. Well, well now. Don't remember anything like that being in there. Let's see now. Uh, pulse is getting pretty weak. Mr. Connolly, don't bother me. I've got more important things here to think about. Mm-hmm. That's it. Here's the end of the rib, all right. Now, if I can uh, just... That's all right, let it go. Don't need the knife anymore. Confound it, Connolly. Give me a little more room to work in. Cabin small enough stairs. Captain... His pulse has stopped. No, it hasn't, Mr. Connolly. Now, now, where the devil doesn't that rib come loose when I... It's no use, Captain. He, he, he's dead. His heart stopped beating. Mr. Connolly, don't stand there. Try to tell me his heart stopped when I can see it beating right now. Mr. Larson. Uh, yes, sir. Would you look at that tool chest behind you? See if you can find me a pair of pliers. <laughs> I doubt if there's ever been another operation like it before or since. By all rights, Captain Miller should have died ten times over, right there on the bunk. Only he, uh, he didn't. He was unconscious for 48 hours, but on the fifth day he was sitting up on a deck chair and cussing because somebody had slung his broken rib overboard instead of saving it so he could whittle out a letter opener.
We were driven 600 miles to the south before the storm blew itself out, and we got the main boiler back into operation and could lay a course for New Bristol. And three days away from port, Captain Weatherfield called all of us officers of the Wakeland together in the chart room, along with First Mate Larson of the Johannes. Gentlemen, <clears throat> there may be some questions in your minds in regard to what this meeting is all about. No doubt you're wondering, even if you aren't asking. Am I right? Well, yes, sir. We have been trying to guess. Then I'll tell you, gentlemen. <clears throat> I called this meeting to put a stop to certain idle rumors which I hear have been floating around. Uh, just what kind of rumors, Captain Weatherfield? Them which says that Captain Miller of late ship Johannes deliberately drove head-on into a storm while racing to make port. <laughs> There's no rumor about that. It's what he was doing. As his first mate, I should know. And I say he wasn't, Mr. Lass. <clears throat> the way I figure it, got caught by the storm without any warning. He gave orders for full speed to try to beat out of it. A couple of hours later, main shaft broke left him helpless without steerage way. Could happen to anybody. Maybe. Only it didn't. I was there, Captain Weatherfield. I know what happened. And there's five of my crew left to back me up. They'll back up anything you say, Mr. Larson. You know that. Then there's nothing to talk about. When the Board of Inquiry gets through with Miller, he won't command another ship as long as he lives. So, there's not going to be any Board of Inquiry. Huh? Maybe that's not up to you. Which is what we're here to decide. I don't get it, Captain. Miller's a rat. He was the first one to jump when we come alongside. Anything that happens to him serves him right. Now, why should you stick up for him? My personal opinion of the man has nothing to do with this, Mr. Connolly. I say there'll be no bard of inquiry, because it suits my purposes that there be none. And uh, just what are your purposes, Captain? I drove my ship 90 miles off a course in a hurricane, risked my life in an open boat... Just for one reason, Mr. Larson. Because I knew you were registered out of New Bristol. Ah, oh, so that's it. Aye, Mr. Connolly, that's it. I operated on a man, saved his life, just so he could stand up alongside of me, have our pictures taken for the newspapers. <laughs> I get it. So, you don't want some messy board of inquiry throwing scandal in the story of your noble rescue on the high sea, eh? You want to be a blasted hero. Mr. Larson, being a hero has got nothing to do with it. But I am planning to get a public apology out of the town of New Bristol. And you, or nobody else, is going to do anything to stop me. Yeah, well, it's too bad you haven't got the whole say about it, Captain. And it's too bad you're so bullheaded, sit on swearing away your captain's ticket, that you forced me to teach you a lesson. And just how are you aiming to do that? By knocking a little sense into your thick noggin, something like this. <laughs> oh. So it's a fight you're after. Yeah. All right. Oh, 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 Come on, Captain. Teach me a lesson. All right, I'm the one you learned in Shanghai. I'll teach you a race. Right. Yes, you got it. You got it, Captain. Get up, Mr. Larson. Uh, I'll get up. All right. Look up. He's got a pair Watch of dividers. So oh, you tried to step it, would you? Oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, Larson, uh, what about it? All right. All right, I'm, I'm through there going to be a board of inquiry? No, no. I'll, I'll back up anything you say. Good. What about the rest of you? Anything I say go? Yes, sir. Sure sure sure. All right, right, then. Yeah. Get back on watch. What do you think this is, a peaceful harbor of a Sunday? It was a clear, sunshiny day when we steamed into New Bristol Harbor and dropped anchor at the mouth of the river. Captain Weatherfield sent Miller on ashore at quarantine, <laughs> insisting that his reason was not just to make sure of having a reception ready. Nonetheless, he spent an hour and a half shaving, trimming his hair, and dressing up in his best shore-going clothes. Uh, but he had a right to strut a little at that. Yeah, he'd moved through a whole series of tough jobs, every one against almost impossible odds, and he'd come out on top. And all because he wanted his daughters up in Maine to know he could do something once in a while besides punch people in the noggin. It was mid-afternoon by the time we finally rowed ashore in the long boat and a good-sized crowd had assembled on the wharf. 
And when we got in close, we could see Captain Miller waiting by the landing, along with a, a regular reception committee, all dressed up in striped pants and top hats like a, a bunch of foreign diplomats. And the head man of the whole layout was the same judge who'd given the captain seven days in jail. Easy now, Mr. Connolly. Yeah. I'll hold this steady, sir. Thank you. Welcome, Captain Weatherfield, on behalf of the town of New Bristol. Well, now, it's mighty nice of you, Judge. Not at all, Captain. We're the ones who are honored. The whole town, and we want you to know it. Well, uh, thank you, Judge. Captain Miller here has given us the complete story. The rescue at sea, the daring operation that saved his life. Uh, here, here. How are you feeling, Captain Miller? Mm, a little tired right now, Captain. Been pretty busy. Arranging things, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. You're a hero in this town, Captain Weatherfield. There's nothing too good for you. We're proud of you. I was wondering if you'd recall a little incident where we met before, Judge, uh, not so long ago. A terrible mistake. I'll never forgive myself. I feel I owe you a public apology, Captain Weatherfield. Well, now, don't believe I know just what to say, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all to say, Captain Weatherfield. As I said before, we're the ones who are honored. The whole town of New Bristol. And all of New England, too, by Jove. Once those reporters get their stories on the wire. Hmm. <coughs> reporters, eh? Well, now, that's going to too much trouble, Judge. Oh, not <laughs> at all, Captain, not at all. They'll be wanting an interview with you, you know. We've had quite a time keeping them off this long. Well, you're a hero, man. Don't you realize that? I only did my duty, Judge. The mm. new Bristol needs more men who only do their duty, Captain Weatherfield. Mighty nice of you to say so. When I recall the way you were treated here a few weeks ago, Captain, well... All I can do is to ask your forgiveness, publicly. I suspect that might be arranged, Judge. I'm not a man to bear a grudge. A fact which your actions have proven, sir. Hmm. Uh, them there fellows with the cameras, are they reporters, well, are they? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, Captain. Well, of course, they're photographers, really. They're taking them pictures to print in the newspapers, are they? That's right, Captain. They'll be seen by people all over the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, suppose we might walk over that way? Certainly, Captain Weatherfield. Certainly, anything you like. Won't you join us, Captain Miller? Thanks, gentlemen. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, if they print a picture of that ship out there, nobody will believe the story. What did you say, Captain Miller? I said they wouldn't believe it. To look at that old mud sky, you wouldn't think she could float in a calm sea, much less... Uh, Captain hey, good heavens, he struck the man. I'll teach you to call my ship a mud sky. Uh, uh, a squint-eyed son of a five-legged salamander. Stop, I say. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Go, go, go. Constable! Constable! Arrest that man and look him up! I'm filing a charge of assault and battery! Escape, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, tonight brought you Habit by F.R. Buckley, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Featured in tonight's cast were John Daner as M Mr. McConley and Louis Van Ruten as Captain Weatherfield, with Wilms Herbert as Captain Miller, Barry Kroger as the judge, and Bill Boucher as First Mate Larson. Special music by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are making your painful way over the great India desert, alone and dying of thirst, while behind you, pursuing you, are the fanatical Kafirs who once bowed to you as king, and now call for your life. Next week, we escape with Rudyard Kipling's exciting story, The Man Who Would Be King. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>